Please turn with me to the book of Micah, chapter 6. Um, it can be found on page 1446 of the Pew Bibles. I'll be reading Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Um, but the sermon text for this morning will be just verses 6 to 8. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh my people, what have I done to you, and how have I wearied you? Testify against me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, from Acacia Grove to Gilgal that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let us stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll bless the reading and preaching of your word that our eyes may be turned to Christ. We pray that your Holy Spirit will give us understanding, that we may know more and more the riches of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Children here, have you ever been caught playing by your parents when you were meant to be doing your homework? I know for me this happened sometimes when I was a kid. And when this happens, there's two responses that you can have. The right response is to apologize, to say you're sorry, and then go back to doing your homework instead of playing. The wrong response, maybe a rebellious child, might say something like this. Well, what do you want from me, mum and dad? Do you want me to study two hours every day doing my homework, and then you'll be happy? Do you want me to study 24 hours a day? Will that make you happy? And how might the parents respond? I might say, well, my dear child, I've told you what is good. I've told you what I require of you. We want what's best for you. We want you to listen to us. And this is a picture of what we see in this passage this morning, Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. In the Israelites' dialogue with God um, through the prophet Micah. And with God's help, I hope to show that God is not pleased with hypocritical outward worship, but requires sincere inward worship. God is not pleased with hypocritical outward worship, but requires sincere inward worship. And we'll see this under two headings. Firstly, hypocritical outward worship in verses 6 to 7, and sincere inward worship in verse 8. So firstly, hypocritical outward worship. So Micah prophesied uh, at the same time as Isaiah. And in the book of Micah, um, he condemns, pronounces God's condemnation on the Israelites' sin. 
but also provides hope for a future restoration. And in chapter 6 here, the scene here is of a courtroom of God's bringing accusations against his covenant people, the Israelites. And in technical language, this is what scholars call a covenant lawsuit. And I use that term because I think it is helpful here. It's a covenant lawsuit here. I remember a covenant, simply speaking, is a binding agreement between two parties. So there were requirements that these parties had to uh, do. And there were consequences if uh, they were broken. And so here, God brings this covenant lawsuit against his people because the Israelites had continually broken the covenant in sinning against God, in not doing what was required of them. And breaking the covenant ordinarily was a serious matter and brought with it serious consequences. But surprisingly here, we see in verse 3 that instead of God having a harsh condemning tone towards the Israelites, he pleads with them. He pleads with them to turn back to him, to repent. We see in verse 3, O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? And then he recounts how he brought them out of Egypt under Moses and the events after that. And so this leads to our passage in verses 6 to 7. Verses 6 to 7 is the response of a representative or a spokesperson for the Israelites responding to this covenant lawsuit um, of the Lord. This is their courtroom defense. And what does this representative say? Verses 6 to 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So we see this Israelites' defense consists of a series of questions, rhetorical questions. And at first, his questions seem reasonable. If I want to come before God, should I bring, should I bring an offering, a burnt offering? Should I bring a year-old calf? That, that, that's what was required. But then this quickly turns into absurdity and mockery. He says, no, does God want me to bring thousands of rams is that what will please god or 10,000 rivers of oil this is said sarcastically and it's similar to my opening illustration of this child asking his parents if he's going to if they will be happy if they study 24 hours a day so far from vindicating the israelites this series of questions actually condemn condemn them because it shows their hypocritical attitude towards sacrifice and towards worship. It shows that they think that God is only pleased with an outward form of worship, that God will be pleased with many, many sacrifices and offerings. Calvin says that these questions are asked by hypocrites who wish to appear as though they were burning with the greatest zeal but who deceive themselves and try to deceive God with their own ceremonies and trifles. Outwardly, the Israelites may appear religious, but inwardly, these questions expose their sinful and wicked heart. There is no repentance of sin. There's no admission of wrongdoing. But instead, they put the blame on God for requiring too much or not being clear in how he should be approached and worshipped. What is your response when someone points out your sin? Whether it's your children, your parents, your spouse, other church members, the elders, the minister, or when we read God's word, when we are convicted of our sin by the Holy Spirit. Do you naturally, immediately get defensive, make excuses, 
and even blame others and your accuser? Do you sometimes respond like this representative Israelite? Or do you naturally confess your sins, ask for forgiveness, and repent? In theory, that might sound easy, but we know in practice it's much harder than that. Especially when we feel that we have been wronged, when we feel that the other side has also sinned and they haven't asked for forgiveness. We want to wait for the other side to apologize first. But as Christians, we are those who have been freely forgiven by God in Jesus Christ for our sins. And so we freely forgive others, knowing that we have been forgiven much more than we forgive others. We have been forgiven for all of our sins and our disobedience against God. Do you know that joy of being forgiven in Christ and thus freely forgive others? Now, one natural question that comes from this passage is whether Micah is doing away with the ceremonial law, with sacrifices. Because in verses 6 and 7, this representative Israelite mentions these sacrifices, mentions bringing burnt offerings, uh, year-old calf. But in verse 8, in Micah's response, he doesn't seem to mention anything about sacrifice. He just mentions maybe religious or ethical behavior. So is Micah saying that the Israelites at that time were not required to offer sacrifices? Well, the answer is clearly no. Sacrifices were required according to the law of Moses. But Micah here is condemning, as we'll see later, is condemning the hypocritical outward worship. He's condemning their attitude toward the sacrifice. We know that God is not pleased with the mere offering of the sacrifice. The sacrificial system, the ceremonial law, was never for the intention of the mere outward offering of a sacrifice. In fact, the need to offer sacrifices was to point the Israelites to their sin, to their disobedience, to their inability to keep the moral law, to keep the Ten Commandments. And ultimately, the sacrifices year after year pointed to the coming Messiah, the suffering servant, who would die for the sins of God's people to bring atonement for them. And so, similarly now, we, though we don't offer sacrifices, God does require of us outward forms of worship. God does require us to diligently attend to the hearing and preaching of God's word. God does require us to pray. God does require us to attend the worship services on the Lord's day. But we know that it is not merely the outward performance of these duties that the Lord requires, but it is our inward heart. And so we must ask ourselves the same question. Firstly, do we perform these duties? And secondly, if we do, how do we perform them? Do we perform them only outwardly, like these, the attitude of these Israelites? Or do we also attend to them inwardly? You know, sometimes we hear from Christians, maybe myself and others as well, that, well, is it dangerous to be too devoted to God? Is it dangerous to study the Bible too much, to study theology? And there is a good reason why this is us, because there is a wrong way we can perform these outward duties. There is a wrong way we can attend the morning and evening worship services. We can come with the critical spirit looking for errors in the preaching, the reading of God's word. We can study theology for our own purposes, for our own pride, for our own self-knowledge. But just because there is a wrong way to do this, there is a wrong way to serve God, uh, to spend our time and energy in doing outwardly good things, 
But this does not mean that we should neglect doing these things. It just means that we should not have this prideful attitude. We should not do these only outwardly, but that we should also do them inwardly. So here Micah is not doing away with the ceremonial law, doing away with the sacrifices, but condemning the Israelites' hypocritical outward worship towards God. And in verse 7, if we continue on, the last part of verse 7, this is the final insult that this representative Israelite brings to God. He says, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Here, this Israelite does mention the word sin, does mention the word transgression. But there's no admission of sin or transgression here. Rather, this Israelite is saying, well, God, you say that I have sinned. You say that I've committed transgressions. Well, do you want me to offer my firstborn child? Is that what will make you happy? Is that what will atone for my sins? And this is doubly offensive to God because not only is there no admission of sin, but it is suggesting that God delights in sacrifice, in human sacrifice. And ironically, the firstborn of this Israelite, or any Israelite, could in no way atone for sin, for his sin. But God is the one who gave his only begotten son to atone for all the sins of his people. God is the one who offered up sacrifices much more valuable than any Israelite could offer. And we, we today, we do not need to offer animal sacrifices for our sin. But we do need to believe in the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of many. Do you today believe in Jesus Christ who died for your sins? Who paid for the price of your sins? Who was sacrificed with the greatest price? And do we give praise and thanks to God each day, knowing that though we have sinned like these Israelites, though we have broken the covenant, that the Lord pleads, pleads for you to repent and to return to him for forgiveness? Do you know this worth of Christ, who is more valuable than thousands of rams, than ten thousands of of rivers of oil. Now secondly, let us consider verse 8 under the heading Sincere Inward Worship. And this is Micah's response to the representative Israelites, to the series of questions that he had. Verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This verse is sometimes taken out of context to argue that the core of Christianity is about social justice. But Micah here is teaching nothing new. He is merely showing and telling the Israelites what sincere inward worship is like. And here I'm using worship in the broader sense of the whole Christian life. This verse is Micah's response on behalf of God to this representative Israelite. And he says, well, God has already told you. You already know what is good. You already know what God requires of you. This was not something new. This was not a new revelation that they needed to know. They did not know how they should, they did not need to know how they should approach God. They did not need to know what God required of them in the covenant. Because this had already been revealed to them in Moses and the subsequent prophets. But Micah, he explicitly singles out three requirements. Three requirements. Firstly, to do justly. Secondly, to love mercy. And thirdly, to walk humbly with your God. And we read Deuteronomy chapter 10 before. And I think Micah is explicitly referencing Deuteronomy chapter 10. 
uh, verses 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Micah, in essence, is summarizing and paraphrasing this commandment, which is basically the Ten Commandments or the moral law. And he's applying it to the Israelites of his time, especially pointing out the things that they were not doing. So let us uh, briefly look at these three requirements that Micah singles out. Firstly, he says, God requires you to do justly. This simply just means to do what was right and proper. Um, in chapter 3 of Micah, Micah condemns the leaders for not doing justly, for not practicing justice. And we see this in verse 1 and verse 9 of Micah chapter 3. And I said, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? And verse 9, Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity. This one requirement was mentioned here because there was one major thing that the leaders and the Israelites in general were not doing. They were not doing justly. There were many injustices that were happening at the time. And this is why the Lord God brought this covenant lawsuit against his people. And we see in chapters 2 and 3 that some of the injustices that are mentioned are, for example, they were taking widows' houses, they were taking the fields of the poor and the weak by force, by violence. And so Micah tells them that God requires them to do justly. And I think the requirement here to do justly is not so much punishing the wicked for their sins, though that is included, but it's focused on these leaders who are oppressing the weak, who are oppressing the widows, the fatherless, and the stranger. To do justly would be to do the opposite. It would be to protect these vulnerable people, to advocate for justice when you saw injustice. And the Lord God, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 12, the Lord God is often described as one who administers justice or who does justice, who loves the stranger, who protects the widow and the fatherless. And so this requirement to do justly is a reflection of the character of God. As God's covenant people, the Israelites were to do justly because this is what God does. And this is no different to what we read of in the New Testament. For example, at the end of James chapter 1, James writes this, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So what opportunities has God given for you to do justly, both in your dealings with others and um, speaking up when others face injustice? And this is particularly talking about within the church, but also outside. When you see injustice, do you speak up? And particularly for those in positions of leadership, do you exercise your authority justly? The church should, be, should aim to be a place of justice, a place where justice is administered. And we do this knowing that the church and society will never be a place of perfect justice, but we do know that there will be a time when this will happen, when our Lord Jesus Christ returns in the new heaven and the new earth. And this is the hope that we hold out, both to those inside the church and those outside the church, that there will be a time where there is justice administered. There will be a time where there is no injustice, when there is no oppression for the weak. And this is only because Jesus Christ suffered the greatest injustice, to die for the wicked, so that 
our sins could be forgiven, that he can bring you and me into his kingdom of righteousness where there will be no sin. Is this your hope? And is this the hope that you present to others? The second requirement that Micah gives us is to love mercy, to love mercy. Other translations might say something like love faithfulness or love kindness. And the reason is because this word is hard to translate into one single English word, often encapsulates more than any one English word can mean. And this requirement is parallel to the first one, to do justice. It refers primarily to our relationship to one another, to other men. Micah here is primarily referring to the covenantal obligations of faithfulness, of mercy, of kindness that the Israelites were meant to show to one another. Doing justly and loving mercy are, we can say, two sides of the same coin. We can say doing justly for Micah was more uh, speaking to the sins of commission that the Israelites were doing in oppressing the weak. But loving mercy, Micah was focusing more on their sins of omission, that they weren't positively showing faithfulness and kindness and mercy to one another. This second requirement also focuses more on the heart. It's loving mercy. This is harder to see. Though love does involve outward action, it's hard to see the inner intentions and desires of others. But this is what the one thing that the Israelites were lacking. They were lacking that sincere inward heart to worship God and to serve others. Outwardly, they may have done some good things. They might have appeared religious. But inwardly, they had no love for mercy or faithfulness to one another. How good is it to have friends who love mercy? Friends who are faithful, who are kind, who are merciful. Especially to those who are inside the church, but also to those who are outside. Does this describe you? Are you someone who can be described as loving mercy? And this word for mercy is often used in the Bible to describe God's relationship to his covenant people. It's used to describe his covenantal faithfulness towards his people. And in particular, we see at the end of Micah, Micah chapter 7, verses 18 to 20, this word is used twice. And I think this is quite telling and helpful to see uh, what this word means. Let me read to you Micah chapter 7, verses 18 to 20. Who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in mercy. He, again, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. This mercy of God is not dependent on the other party. We see, in fact, here that it says that God does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Despite the sins of the Israelites, despite the sins of his people, God delights in mercy. And this is the mercy, the covenant faithfulness that he shows towards his people in continually pleading for them to return, to repent, to come back to him, to do what he requires of them. And so the covenant faithfulness, this loving mercy that the Israelites were required and we are required to show to one another flows from that that God has shown to us in Christ through the covenant, through the forgiveness of sins that we have. Do you love mercy? Not only when others are good to you, but when you have been sinned against, when you have been wronged, when everything and everyone seems to be turning against you, do you still love mercy and show that towards one another? And remember, our motivation to love mercy comes from God. It comes not from ourselves, 
but because God has shown his covenantal faithfulness toward us in Christ, who despite our continual sins, despite us breaking the covenant, shows his mercy toward us, towards his people. Now thirdly, let us look at the third requirement that Micah gives us, to walk humbly with your God. This focuses on our relationship toward God in contrast to the first two requirements. And just like verses 6 and 7, there is a progression here in these three requirements. The first one, we can say, was more the outward actions to do justly. The second one, maybe more on our inward desires to love mercy. And thirdly, this one focuses on our motivations or how we can do these actions, the source of our desires and actions, walking humbly with your God. And this is a correction and condemnation on the leaders of Micah's time who were not walking humbly with God. And this walking humbly with God is described uh, many times in the Old Testament, especially for Enoch and for Noah who walked with God. Are you walking with God right now? And how is your walk with God? Are you walking with Him humbly? Walking with God denotes a lifestyle pattern and permeates the whole Christian life. It is attending to the wills and ways of God. It is doing what God requires you to do. It is going where God requires you to go. It is thinking what God requires you to think. It is, there is also an aspect of fellowship and communion here, of communication. And this is done through the means of grace, through the reading of scriptures, to hearing the reading and preaching of God's word, and through prayer. There is an enjoyment in the company of God and in his presence. And maybe an illustration of this walking together with God is I, I live opposite a park and I often see couples walking hand in hand every night talking to each other as they walk laps around the park. But maybe an even better illustration is a child clinging onto his father's hand. At the same time, the father clinging to his child's hand. And this is important because Micah here says that we have to do it humbly. We have to recognize our place and God's place. We are not God. We are his creatures. We are finite creatures that are dependent on God. God has given everything that we have. And so we walk humbly with him. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. But we are finite, dependent beings. This humility is a true humility, knowing that we have been saved by grace, not because of anything we can or will do. And walking humbly with God is not something that is done once, but is done continuously. It can be argued that the first two requirements we might not always have opportunity to, to do, but the third requirement to walk humbly with God we always can do because God has promised in his covenant to dwell with his people. He is with us. He indwells us by his Holy Spirit. So do you walk humbly with God each and every day? And do you find joy in that, in that communion and fellowship in walking with God as you partake of the means of grace? And we do this in humble dependence, but also trusting and knowing that he will lead us, that he will guide us where it is good for us and that he'll lead us not only in this life but all the way to the next. And so as we look at this passage, hope that we have seen that God does not delight, God is not pleased with hypocritical outward worship but he requires sincere inward worship. May God help us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father,
We thank you that you have promised to dwell with us, that you have clearly set out your requirements for us in your word. And despite our disobedience, you plead with us to return. You have given us your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. You have given us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, that we may always be in dependence of you and rely on your sustaining power in all that we do. Help us to walk humbly with you day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.